Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and you're tuned into Propaganda Watch, that series where we dissect propaganda of various kinds and examine how it is functioning on the public consciousness. But something that I stressed recently in episode 357 of the Corbett Report, for those keeping track at home on language is a weapon, is that it is necessary when we are examining any subject, propaganda being no different, to come to a base understanding of the terms involved, to define our terms before we begin a discourse on a subject. Otherwise, we may end up talking across purposes or talking of vague generalities. And as I say, propaganda is no different. And although we've examined propaganda from many, many, many different perspectives over the past year of this Propaganda Watch series, we still keep coming back to that question of what is Propaganda. It is a slippery word because there is a difference between the denotation of that word and the connotation of that word. If you look the word up in a dictionary, well, even from dictionary to dictionary, the definition will likely differ somewhat. But if you look it up in an encyclopedia, there will be a different definition or a different way of looking at that word. And just from absorbing that word in our general cultural discourse, you may have a different idea about propaganda. So we return once and again and again and again, to that question of what is propaganda and what can be propaganda and what cannot be propaganda. Where do we draw the line between, say, propaganda and marketing? Uh, These are important distinctions to make if we want to have a deeper understanding of propaganda and the way that it functions on the public consciousness. So, Let's turn to an interesting little snippet that I heard recently in a conversation that was recorded a couple of years ago with Dr. Robert Lustig, who was talking about precisely this subject on propaganda and marketing and truth and lies and misinformation and disinformation. And let's listen to Dr. Lustig's uh, attempt to differentiate these subjects. Well, you bring up a very good question. What is the difference between marketing and propaganda. Marketing is using information to espouse your point of view. Propaganda is using disinformation to espouse your point of view. The difference is the truth. If you're telling the truth, it's marketing. If you're telling a lie, it's propaganda. Now, that is an, just a small snippet from a from very much longer conversation, so please do go and listen to the full conversation in its full context. But I do want to interrogate that notion that Robert Lustig smuggles in there, that propaganda is using lies to try to convince people. Marketing is using truth or facts to try to convince people. I do not accept that distinction. And this is something that is open to debate because... The, The definition of words does change over time, given how words are deployed and the meanings that they come to have and the the way that people understand and interpret them. Probably no better example of that change over time is, uh, is, can be found than in the word propaganda itself, which, as I've noted before, and I think needs to be stressed, a century ago, when propaganda was used, it was initially used in a very neutral, descriptive way, uh, as speech or other forms of communication that are meant to try to persuade someone of something. And that isn't necessarily an evil thing. We're all trying to persuade people of things all the time. But it has taken on that connotation throughout the 20th century, obviously after the playing out of World War I, and then the playing out of World War II, and all of the propaganda that was deployed on the publics of all countries, by all governments, on all sides of all conflicts, we've started to understand that term in a very different way, so that propaganda is an evil, manipulative, deceptive communication that is used to try to persuade you of something usually that is false, or that is at least debatable. And you get some of this ambiguity when you try, as I say, to look up the word propaganda and what it means. And one example of that that I found particularly interesting is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. And this is from Britannica.com. So I would be interested if anyone out there in the crowd has a very old uh, copy of Encyclopedia Britannica published, you know, decades or a century ago and see how this term has changed to this current online form. But at any rate, in this uh, this piece on propaganda from Encyclopedia Britannica, written by Bruce Lennis Smith, it says, Propaganda, dissemination of information, facts, arguments, rumors, half-truths, or lies to influence 
public opinion. And it goes on to say, propaganda is the more or less systematic effort to manipulate other people's beliefs, attitudes, or actions by means of symbols, words, gestures, banners, monuments, music, clothing, insignia, hairstyles, designs on coins and postage stamps. What an intriguing example. <laughs> Maybe one we'll circle back to in a future Propaganda Watch. And so forth. Deliberateness and a relatively heavy emphasis on manipulation distinguish propaganda from casual conversation or the free and easy exchange of ideas. The propagandist has a specified goal or a set of goals. To achieve these, he deliberately selects facts, arguments, and displays of symbols and presents them in ways he thinks will have the most effect. To maximize effect, he may omit pertinent facts or distort them, and he may try to divert the attention of the reactors, the people whom he is trying to sway, from everything but his own propaganda. All right, now that, I think, is a useful starting point for examining propaganda because it allows for truth and facts to be used as a propagandistic tool in the hands of the propaganda uh, propagandist. And I, I think we might need to look at an example of that just to contextualize this and understand it, because it is an important point. Propaganda does not necessarily mean lie. Lie does not necessarily mean propaganda. They're not, they're not the same word. And sometimes, facts can be used to propagandize the public. I don't think that exonerates the propaganda. It doesn't make it any less manipulative or deceitful in a way. Uh, you can use the truth to deceive. And that's an important point and one we have to wrap our head around. So let's start this conversation by looking at a specific example from a book that I'm currently reading. It's called Selling War. The, head, the uh, subhead is the British Propaganda Campaign Against American Neutrality in World War II. This is by uh, Nicholas John Cole. And it's, uh, it's an interesting book. It's on that very, very specific subject of British propaganda in America in the lead up to World War II, um, basically against American neutrality. Very specific focus, but uh, very interesting from that perspective. And it has a lot of useful information. And so let's just take a look at uh, just a little tidbit from this book, Selling War, uh, where he's writing about Rene McCall's press and radio division worked like a news agency, providing reliable, free, and frequent British stories and photographs. McCall also contributed pieces under his own name to such mag magazines as Current History and Atlantic Monthly. McCall tailored his press service to fit his customers' needs. To sharpen this output, he engaged an experienced American journalist as a news editor, an old New York Herald Tribune man named Carl Johnson. With Johnson's help, McCall devised a system whereby incoming Ministry of Information news and features were divided into material suitable for a national wire slugging and items to hold back for release to a single paper. McCall knew that an exclusive feature given to the right newspaper could command particular attention. In February 1941, McCall scored his first major propaganda coup. His diary recorded the sequence of events. On February 10th, McCall met John Pepper of British Security Coordination and the old French propagandist de Salle to discuss plans for photographic propaganda. The following day, McCall put these plans into action. Over lunch at the artist and writer's restaurant with Powell, the inter-allied informatic committee's photographic officer, McCall produced a packet of photographs from occupied Poland showing graphic scenes of Nazi butchery. He did not record in his diary how these came into his possession, but he noted slipped Powell the Polish horror pictures. The IAIC, the Inter-Allied Informatic Committee office, passed the pictures on to their final destination, the liberal newspaper PM. On February 14th, McCall wrote in triumph, PM splashed the Polish pictures. The paper made full use of its exclusive. The cover carried a grisly photograph of a German firing squad. The, cap the caption proclaimed, these are Poles being shot by Germans in the new order in Europe. A German aviator liked this picture so well that he carried it with him. That's how it happens to be here, found in his pocket with four others when he was shot down in England. The other pictures covered an inside page in the centerfold. They showed prisoners marching to their deaths. A second firing squad, Poles, apparently Jews, digging a mass grave surrounded by piles of dead bodies, and two corpses dangling from a street lamp. The story of the pilot was almost certainly a fabrication, a convenient paperclip contri contrived to link pictures assembled by McCall from material smuggled out of Poland by the 6th Division of the Polish Home Army uh, and passed by it to either the British Ministry of Information or the Secret Service. But the impact of the photographs outweighed all questions of their origin. 
With the help of, a, of an obliging American paper, McCall had provided pictures with all the impact of a Great War atrocity story, but within the new boundaries of propaganda with fact. All right, so let's just take that story as it is, and let's just take it as these photographs are authentic photographs, real atrocities that were really committed in Poland, and then were passed on to newspapers. Now, again, there may be things that we can dispute about that, but let's just take that as fact. That is propaganda. Even if those photographs are 100% authentic and real and actually depict what they are claiming to depict and all of that, the fact that they have been smuggled into an American newspaper, essentially, by British propagandists, does itself inherently make those factual documents propaganda. It doesn't make them lies or untruths in and of itself just from that series of events. No, the, the photographs can be 100% authentic. The effect can still be propaganda. Because uh, in this particular case, even if the photographs are real and authentic and they portray what they're being said to portray and everything, as, as uh, the book notes here, the story about finding them in the, in the pocket of a, of a German aviator is, is almost completely almost certainly completely fabricated. So there is a lie in use to sort of smear over where did these pictures come from? Because again, the point, uh, as Encyclopedia Britannica points out, the point is to um, distract people from everything but the propaganda and the propagandist's message. So anything that could kind of complicate things. And one of the things that this book, Selling War, does uh, quite well is to contextualize the, 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 the uh, American news media and the public's inherent distrust of anything that whiffed of British propaganda in the run-up to World War II because, specifically because, of the ridiculous propaganda that was used to corral America into the First World War. Uh, the First World War. And, and obviously, if you've seen the World War I conspiracy, you know what I'm talking about. But that was common knowledge in the United States in that period in the late 1930s. That's why there was such a strong anti-interventionist mood in America at that time that had to be overcome by the British propagandists, and they, they did extensive work on that, which is documented in this book. Um, but that's why, because people inherently knew anything that sniffed or smelled of British propaganda was, it, it's garbage, it's lies, they're just trying to manipulate us into war. So they had to, they had to at all times try to cover up, oh no, this, is, this was found in, a, in the pocket of a pilot that was shot down and blah, blah, blah. They could never say, yeah, this was passed to us by British propagandists because the American public would say, well, I don't, uh, whatever these photographs are and whatever they, they purport to prove, I know it's propaganda that is designed to rally, rally us into war. So they have to cover that part of it up. But the point still stands that facts, actual truthful facts, can still be used as propaganda as long as the propagandists can manipulate and distort and otherwise obscure the contextualization of those facts that would put them in a way that would make them understandable uh, in uh, against the propagandists' motives. Now, this might seem sort of theoretical or something, or just a nitpicking point, but I think it is an actually essentially important point, because if we constantly think that propaganda is only equated to lies, then we see when we see something that is truth, and that, that can be verifiably proven as true, we shouldn't just disarm. Oh, okay, then it's not propaganda. No, we have to understand, okay, so what's the context of this truth? And what is it, what, why are they pointing out this in this particular way, in this particular context, through this particular medium? And what, what is that leading us towards? Is that trying to draw, draw us towards a certain conclusion? And if so, why? And if so, then what are the other facts that they may be leaving out here? Because a truth is embedded in a context of truth. And if you take a single truth out of that context of truth, you can insert that truth into a context of lies that prevent, pr provide a different framework. Again, this is essential stuff. This is essential for us to understand if we hope to combat, combat the propagandists. So today, I have a little homework assignment for you. I have provided an example here from this book, Selling War, from the 1940s, uh, early 1940s, talking about the British propaganda campaign against American neutrality uh, pre-World War II. But uh, I would like to put it out there for as a, as a homework assignment. What other examples can you think of, of truth and facts being used as 
propaganda to draw people towards certain conclusions. And how how was that accomplished? I think it's an important thing for us to understand, so I'd like to sit, draw on the uh, wisdom of the crowd out there to find more examples of this and to dissect them. So I will invite your participation, as always, in the comment section. Not the comment section of GooTube or any other social media platform. No, the comment section of CorbettReport.com which is the only comment section that matters, as we all know. So I'm looking forward to the discussion there. As always, I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. I'll be talking to you again very shortly. One hundred years ago, the most devastating war the world had ever seen came to an end. In the craters of those battlefields lay the fallen. But why? What was World War I about? What did it mean? For a century, we have been told a partial history of that war. But now, we can finally learn the truth about the First World War. This is false history. It's not even acceptable to call it fake news. It's just disgusting. So what these people gained was the foothold for world government. And now the time came to slaughter some part of the sheep. The World War I Conspiracy. Watch the documentary for free at CorbettReport.com slash WWI.